blockchain. So the, the way I like to say it is that while Bitcoin was programmable money in theory, with Miniscript we make it programmable money in practice and we can actually start developing cool wallets like Liana that use these policies. Bitcoin kind of uh, bring contrast and first you, you think that Bitcoin is a scam and yeah. everything is uh, okay. <laughs> and then you, you, you realize that it's the contrary. Like yeah. uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the only, the only thing, thing that is not, not a, scam. a scam. So in this way, if someone comes with a typical $5 wrench and they threaten you and say like, okay, send me all the Bitcoins, mm. you can actually show them that, oh, the maximum you can spend is 0.1 Bitcoins. And there is no way you can do more than that. What's the second best? There is no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset, it's called Bitcoin, right? Right, there's no second best. It will be an ad for Liana. <laughs> Good. So, hello, Salvatore. Hi, Hi Victor. <laughs> it's the almost second time we, we met. We met uh, f the first time at a restaurant uh, completely randomly. We had a discussion about Miniscript. Yeah. Um, so you were working with Ledger. Could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about you? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Salvatore. Uh, I'm a Bitcoiner working at Ledger since uh, more than two years and a half at this point. And yeah, I work on the on the Bitcoin application that runs on the hardware wallet itself, so on the de embedded device. Um, and I've been working to try to bring some new features like better multi-signature support and now Miniscript policies. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to bring some cool new features for Bitcoiners. Okay. Could you explain in your words, what is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? Yeah. Ooh. Bitcoin is the money of the future and the, the, and the money of the internet, which I think is the same thing. Okay. Like the magic money. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, magic internet money. Right? That's the meme, right? <laughs> okay. And wh what does it mean to you? What, uh, what can it improve in your life for the everyday life? Well, what was your trigger point? Yeah. Personally, I come from a computer science background. So for me, I come from finding the idea fascinating because of reading the white paper and just thinking how it solves a problem which is difficult to solve, which is how do you get consensus in a distributed system, right? Uh, the understanding of the implication of what is money, what could bring that to the world, uh, this came a bit later. Um, so, so yeah, but this is probably natural in Bitcoin. People come from very diverse backgrounds and people understand Bitcoin from different angles, but nobody understands Bitcoin fully the first time they hear about Bitcoin. That's why the first reaction people have learning about Bitcoin is Bitcoin is a scam. <laughs> but then you understand why Bitcoin is not a scam and you, you learn some more aspects. And, and, and yeah, over time I learned to, to realize what are the implications of money in society, why having a good money matters, what, are the, what influence money has in politics, in the government, and, and, and so that's why I think Bitcoin for me is in this perfect spot where it's something that I have fun thinking about, I have fun developing, but at the same time I find it as a form of activism because I think it's one of the most important things that we, we can bring to the world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how um, like Bitcoin kind of uh, bring contrast and first you, you think that Bitcoin is a scam and yeah. everything is uh, okay. <laughs> And then you, you, you realize that it's the contrary, like yeah. uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the only thing, only thing that is not, <laughs> not a scam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so right now you, you're working with Ledger and you've been working on the implementation of a mini script mm -hmm. inside uh, the Ledger uh, devices. Can you explain a little bit what is mini script, what it's uh, allow us to do and why yeah. you, you're working on it? So what is mini script? Well, uh, one of the people that I found most influential while learning about Bitcoin, like for many, was Andreas Antonopoulos. And uh, Andreas often describes Bitcoin as programmable money. And that's because Bitcoin has this concept of script where you can basically enforce what are the spending conditions of some coins. And so people are used to just using a hardware wallet or something to spend, which means like you have your own keys and you can spend with those. Uh, but more sophisticated systems can be made where, for example, multi-signature, where many people have to, uh, multiple people have to sign uh, to, to be able to spend the coins. Um, but script is much more powerful than that. Um, and this is not something new. It's something that Bitcoin has been a lot more powerful than that for a long time, uh, because there are other things that script can do. For example, uh, a script can do uh, time locks, which means you can uh, uh, put some spending conditions that are only valid after a given amount of time. Uh, 
and the combination and, and also you can also any two spending conditions that are valid like multi-signature or something with a time lock you can also compose them so you can also have the end of these two conditions or or the or of these two conditions so for example you could make policies that are uh, like could make some coins that are spendable uh, today with some keys but then you have some other paths that are only available after some time which is the, what liana is doing uh, <laughs> and so the challenge is that programming these things in Bitcoin has always been very difficult because script is a complicated language to work with in terms of developer tooling. Um, and what Miniscript brings is that all these kind of spending policies that are interesting in Bitcoin script can be composed and, um, and analyzed and worked with from the point of view of the software in a fully automatic, uh, automatic way. So once you have software that understands Miniscript, you don't have to write any more special tooling to just understand that specific policy, uh, but you can just analyze the policy and understand uh, by looking at it, how it needs to be signed. So how do you actually satisfy the necessary conditions so you can spend the scripts? And so Miniscript, it's, it's a big revolution in how we can do these things in Bitcoin because it makes all the software that understands Miniscript easy to program and interoperable with each, with each other. So. Even if it does, it's not like a soft fork, it's not like Taproot that adds some new feature to Bitcoin, but it actually makes feature that were available in theory, but in practice, nobody was using because it was not feel really feasible to, to develop. Okay. So the, the way I like to say it is that while Bitcoin was programmable money in theory, with Miniscript, we make it programmable money in practice and we can actually start developing cool wallets like Liana that use these policies. Okay. And could you explain with your world what, is, uh, what Liana is doing? And what could be the for you the next implementation of uh, Miniscript that could be really a mm -hmm. game changer in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem? Yeah. So the the main idea of Liana is to have uh, multiple spending paths, like the way the, uh, we are saying that Miniscript enables. Uh, and the idea is to have one main spending path, which is available right now. Um, and this is the the spending condition that you would use on a day to day basis. This is for a uh, wallet that you would, for example, use often. Um, uh, and then you can have additional spending policies that are already enabled after some amount of times, let's say after six months. Uh, so this could be used for multiple things. Uh, one of them is, for example, uh, recovery, meaning if you lose your main spending path because you lose your seed or because maybe your your backup is, is burned or something, your cuts eats your backup, uh, then you have to wait some amount of time, but then you have some other way of spending these coins. And that could be a different backup that you store somewhere else, or it could be some other friend helping you, or it could be some service that does it. Um, like today, there are already some assisted custody services like uh, Casa or Unchained Capital, which are quite popular for multi-sig uh, setups. Mm -hmm. uh, but Miniscript adds a new dimension where these services can be completely trustless in the sense that unless you lose ask access to your main spending path, the, the secondary spending path is never available. Yeah. So that's, that creates some new interesting ways of developing new wallets that uh, I think are very interesting in terms of security and trade-offs. Okay. And um, at the restaurant, you, you, you talked to me about a way of how Miniscript could help us increase our security and uh, the way we protect our Bitcoin by uh, adding some uh, features of uh, kind of multi-sig mm -hmm. without the user really uh, having the issue yeah. of uh, controlling it and set up it. Uh, and uh, for most of users, it's, uh, it's too complicated. They, they don't want to yeah. try to do it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Like one of the things, um, so this is not specific to Miniscript in the sense that some of these things could be built also with multi-signature, uh, but Miniscript definitely wi uh, widens a lot the scope of what can be done. Uh, so typically people think about multi-sig in the context of uh, uh, very cold, very deep cold storage, like uh, coins that are very uh, well protected because you need multiple keys. Maybe you store these keys in different places. Uh, but this kind of comes with trade-offs in terms of usability. Um, and one of the things that I'm more excited about is that uh, with Miniscript, you could create uh, spending policies where it kind of makes sense to use keys that are a little bit less secure, which is what we normally call uh, 
uh, hot keys because maybe there are keys that are uh, stored on a server mm -hmm. uh, because they add some new security features, but without the trade-offs that you, you would have if you do the same thing in a, in a multi-sig wallet. Uh, one example would be that you could have, um, if you have a single signature wallet, um, like in Liana, you could do a single signature wallet with additional spending path for a recovery path. But now for the main spending path, one thing that co you could do is that you replace the main spending path instead of having just one key, you could have two keys. So one is the one that you have, for example, on your hardware wallet, like you usually do. And the second key is something that could be hosted by an al always online servers, server, it could be a service. Um, and this always online key just signs in background. So while you're, while you're providing your main key with your hardware wallet, meanwhile, your software wallet can contact the service and ask for the secondary key. And what it does is that while this key is a hot key, so it's less trusted than what we have on the hardware wallet, this additional key could uh, enforce uh, additional policies that are not possible on the hardware wallet. For example, you could put some daily spending limits. Mm -hmm. So you could instruct the service to say, never sign more than 0.1 Bitcoins per day. So in this way, if someone comes with a typical $5 wrench and they threaten you and say like, okay, send me all the Bitcoins, mm -hmm. you can actually show them that, oh, the maximum you can spend is 0.1 Bitcoins and there is no way you can do more than that. So this allows to put kind of some fail-safe mechanisms so that you can protect uh, how much damage happens if your main key uh, is, is compromised. Um, and you can do this kind of policies that it's impossible to do in a script, like you cannot put daily spending limits in Bitcoin script. Uh, but still, because like in Liana, you can have additional recovery paths that don't need this hotkey, you are not trusting the server. Because if you do that with a two of two multi-sig, the moment the service refuses signing, your coins are locked forever. So in, in, by combining this model of two of two multi-sig with uh, mini script for the time, lock, the time locks, you can create systems where these additional features comes, come without really uh, making your security trade-offs any worse in other aspects. So the service is entirely non-custodial and uh, anytime you can get your funds out without their help. So I'm really excited about the possibilities all these things enable. Um, so, so far we, we are able to launch Miniscript on, uh, on SegWit only. Many of these things will become a lot better once we implement this on, on Taproot, and especially once we manage to implement some more advanced features like Music, potentially Frost in the future. But those are coming, there is work to do, and it's the work is tough. subject, so. <laughs> uh, complicated subject. And uh, so, so that's the next thing you're working on for now. Yeah, those are definitely in the roadmap to figure out uh, okay. how to do these things. Okay. And now to, to move a little bit out of a uh, technical uh, question. In the ecosystem, most of the people say that uh, either Bitcoin succeed and it uh, kind of go to the infinity or Bitcoin mm -hmm. die and go to zero. Like it cannot really have a middle ground where it stay flat. Mm -hmm. Like it, it seems like it's impossible. Like uh, it will just uh, die uh, because it's uh, worthless and something better happened or it get attacked by uh, the government or something else. And what is for you the reason that uh, could make Bitcoin die today? Uh -huh. well, what is uh, the reason that you're not hmm. uh, leveraging uh, at 100% of Bitcoin? Uh, well, don't leverage. That's <laughs> usually if you leverage, you, you're going to lose all your money. Uh, but. Um, yeah, why would Bitcoin fail? Uh, I think complacency is the most likely thing. Uh, Compliancy? Complacency, like people ah. thinking that Bitcoin is already perfect and in, uh, inattackable, that cannot be beaten, uh, while we know that there is a lot of improvements to do and there is a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Like if, if we stop improving today, uh, there are things that can go wrong. Uh, and for example, people using too much custodial services, that's one way that could uh, lead to attacks to Bitcoin that are really uh, dangerous. And that's why I think improving how we do self-custody is important because if you don't get a good UX for self-custody, it's very difficult to reach the 8 billion people that you want to reach. So mm -hmm. uh, like what we have today, it's good enough for a bit nerdier people who take the time to learn. But if we want our grandmoms to be able to use Bitcoin in the future, um, there will be non-technical people who struggle to understand how Bitcoin works and these people need to be able to use it securely anyway. So that's, that's a big challenge in how to make security and UX work well together. Because if we don't do that, 
we risk that people use uh, custodial services too much instead of using self-custody because it's a lot easier to get a good UX with custodial services. And that could be one way Bitcoin could be attacked, the same way that gold lost the being the standard money because self-custody gold was not feasible. Um, and, and yeah, I also see some tendency from part of the community to say like, oh, uh, any change to Bitcoin is an attack and we shouldn't change Bitcoin. And while I think there is value in conservatism, we should also uh, not stop. We should we should not stop being critical and uh, uh, analyze all the proposals that come, because if some proposals bring good improvements to Bitcoin, then we should consider them and uh, and not just consider everything an attack. So there is a lot of work to do. There are a lot of improvements in Bitcoin on the protocol level, out of the protocol level, on the software stack. Yeah, yeah, like I think uh, there is a lot of work to do still in, in self-custody. Uh, Miniscriptive, one of the things, there is a lot more. Uh, mm, yeah. Like there is, even with Miniscript, there will be challenges in how to, to do these things with a good user interface, um, like with a good user experience. And, and yeah, we need to work to minimize the friction for the users because the often people working in security tends to consider in absolute sense, what is the most secure way of doing things. But the reality with practical security is that what people end up using is what it's easy to use. So mm -hmm. sometimes the best trade off for the majority of users is something which is not the most secure thing in theory, but is the most deployable security level. Yeah. And as long as that's good enough, uh, that can still work well. So I think the goal is to make practical security with a good UX as strong as possible. Not necessarily to have the strong possible security for every user because that might be an unachievable goal instead. Yeah, I think uh, the history uh, show, show us uh, that it's true because gold uh, wasn't used uh, anymore at the end because it wasn't, uh, like the UX wasn't good. Like you couldn't uh, use it to everyday life. Yeah. And so... Like a typical yeah. example in uh, uh, security in, in, in companies and so on is that sometimes for, for better security they tell uh, employees to change their password every three months with a password which is hard to remember mm. uh, but sometimes that could have the uh, unexpected result that people write the new password and they attach it to the to the screen right mm. uh, and so that completely cancels any form of security that users have so the intention of making them rotate passwords is good but the result of forcing them through their passwords might be a reduction in security. And, and so I think that's, that's the challenge in our industry, that we are coming from a setup where we want to guarantee the strongest level of security, well, probably a lot higher than what banks do today, uh, but we also want to get a, a good UX. And, and I think it's possible. Like, I'm optimistic that we can, we can improve. And what would you advise to uh, to someone that uh, is trying to improve his security of everyday life, um, not uh, only in Bitcoin, what he could do to improve uh, to improve it? What is the, the easy way? Yeah, I, I think for most people already doing simple things like starting to use a password manager will be okay. <laughs> will be a big improvement. Uh, well, for people who are new to to Bitcoin, get a harder wallet. Uh, probably it's it's a good advice. Software wallets tend to be hacked. Uh, like software security is not very strong. Uh, and, but yeah, I really think that the way we get people to uh, use good security is by giving them a good UX with security by default. Uh, mm. And so yeah. harder wallet has our first step. What we can build with the new stuff that comes with Miniscript, I think uh, it's all to be built. Liana is the first, there are other companies like Anchor Watch and many others looking at it and building some cool stuff. And so I'm really excited about the, the things that will come in the next few years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for everything. It was Thank a pleasure. You. Bye.